So I'm Professor Melissa Murphy. I'm the director of the entrepreneurship minor these days, as well as a professor for the Department of Management. I teach a number of our courses across campus, but what's unique about the entrepreneurship minor is that we are open to all majors on campus. Over a hundred majors get to walk into this, the doors of the business school, which is really exciting. We are 45% women, 20% first generation. So it's a really exciting time for us as we scale the minor and launch a new institute on our way to be the number one program <laughs> in the world. And in order to do that, we rely on a lot of mentors and heroes here in Austin in our 40 Acres ecosystem. So I have the pleasure of spending the afternoon with these incredible women that are on campus with us from time to time. Some of us are graduates of the university as well. So you'll get to hear a lot about their stories. But we'll, we'll kick things off with some introductions. So Gay, you wanna go first? Hi, I'm Gay Gaddis, and I uh, guess I've been an entrepreneur most of my life, although I did work uh, in corporate for a while before I started my own company in 1989. Uh, it was T3, became one of the top digital marketing agencies in the country and the largest woman-owned advertising agency in the United States. Uh, and so I sold it uh, in 2019 and have continued to do entrepreneurial things like starting a program here called Women Who Mean Business through Exec Ed at, at McCombs and also uh, I'm an artist. And so that's uh, leading a life of selling and producing art is also an entrepreneurial endeavor too. Ash, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ashlyn Gentry, you born in Las Vegas, got my bachelor's and my master's and my PhD studying political speech, campaign rhetoric, because I thought I wanted to be the next Carl Rove, James Carville, turns out politics not a fun place to work. <laughs> uh, so I didn't want to lose that skill set, picked it up and moved it over into business consulting, was chief of staff for the Hill and Knowlton CEO for a couple years. Peter Thiel's team found me, took me out to New York for a Palantir, um, worked with Fortune 100 CEOs, helping them to figure out how to do data transformation work uh, and work on the most critical existential issues in their companies. One of my clients asked me to found an investment firm with him. Uh, we did, we acquired two events-based businesses, the Tribeca Film Festival and Girlboss, uh, at the end of 2019, two months later, anyone knows what happened? Um, so we ended up selling our lion's share of Tribeca to James Murdoch, our co-investor, and then sold Girlboss as well. Thought I wanted to work in PR again, went to Edelman, uh, launched a new business unit six months later, my boss, who was the US CEO turned global vice chairman, decided he was gonna leave Edelman and is now the chief communications officer at BCG. And I said, you know what? Screw this, I'm just gonna be a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm doing today. Hi, um, I'm Tiffany Chen and my husband and I founded Tiff's Treats, which is a warm cookie delivery company um, right here on campus actually back in 1999 after I stood him up on a date and baked him some <laughs> apology cookies. Um, the cookies were warm when he got them and all of a sudden light bulb uh, went off and we started right out of college. So uh, in 99 out of his college apartment, we started baking and delivering cookies out of the oven. Um, fast forward 23 years later, uh, we are still doing the same thing, uh, but now we've got about 1800 uh, people on our team and we're at 76 locations now and growing. And we just released our first book a couple weeks ago. It's called, It's Not Just Cookies. Hi, I'm Connie Reed, and I am the founder, CEO, and creative director of a company called Consuela. Um, I kind of joke and laugh because it's, it's a bag company and we do gift products too, but I think we're a service company masquerading as a bag company. Um, our purpose is so that people feel valued, seen, heard, and loved, and that is really what informs every decision about what we do. Um, the company was founded about 15 years ago, and I had three ideas around this company. One was I wanted to do my art. I was doing physical art, but it was a hobby, and I needed a business so that I could keep staying motivated and be able to do it. And I wanted to work in Mexico. I had a lot of fond memories of car trips in Mexico with my dad in interior Mexico, so I wanted to support the traditional artist communities there. And um, I also wanted to support women. So I started out to do this business. Right now, today, we have a wholesale channel that's about 1,200 boutiques across the US. That's 50% of our business. 
The other half of the business is direct consumer channel um, with a website and two stores local around in Austin. And um, we also manufacture, in, in addition to finished goods, we manu manufacture all of the materials that go into the bags. So we have proprietary materials that are vinyls and leathers and embroideries and things like that. And so we are involved in the whole vertical supply chain and have 700 people who work for us there in Mexico and then a team of 50 here in Austin. Um, we shipped 600,000 units last year. We're privately held and we're a certified evergreen company. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, uh, we're gonna start with the first question on the panel. Um, what is the hard stuff about being an entrepreneur? And it's hard, we know that. A lot of entrepreneurs fail. Um, and we're also going to talk about what's uniquely hard maybe for women running their businesses. One thing that we're excited to launch in the fall of 2022 is the Women in Entrepreneurship Specialization here in the minor. So we'll kick things off. Um, Connie, I had you answering this question first, talking a little bit about where it started and what's been so hard for you in your journey. Sure, thanks. Um, well, starting the company, so I came from corporate America. I have a a computer science degree. I first worked in Houston at one of the big oil and gas companies and then I worked in tech there. So I was employee number 23,620 when I left corporate America and I became employee number one. So um, it was great because you know I did what I want when I wanted. I made all my decisions, everything, no problem. But as the company started growing, of course, you add people. Initially, you had generalists because for me as a bootstrapper, I couldn't afford like big, you know, people with huge backgrounds and expensive price tags. Next, you grow and you get those people. But at the end of the day, I feel like I'm always dealing with people more than I want to. I, I feel like a huge, huge part of my life and my business, even before I walked into this room, I was sitting out there dealing with two human resource issues. And um, so a lot of times I think, wow, when would be the point that we stop talking about? Are they happy? When were they happy? Do they need more flex time? Where is their remote work? What is happening? And just so many things around people and emotions and all of that. So I would say I love the business and, and the people is the biggest challenge for me. And Tiffany, we were gonna talk about you starting at the age of 19, right? Yeah, we were what that was like when we started, uh, which I think is a really good thing because one of the things I think is hardest about being an entrepreneur is the risk, right? The financial risk of doing it. It's not like another job where if you lose your job, you can move on to another thing. And um, in our case, if we lost this job, we'd be paying back loans for the rest of our lives. And I think many people are in that position. So that's really difficult to do. It was easy for us to do because we were stupid. Um, so that, you know, that makes it easier, but as an adult, it's hard to take on those risks. And I think even as you grow, it becomes harder and harder to feel like you wanna make those risky moves. And so for me, that's one of the things, different people have different risk tolerance. I'm on the low end, but luckily my husband is my partner and he's on like the high end of like feeling good about it. So he helps push me off. Um, but you're always doing that. And then something you were saying is making me kind of smile about being an entrepreneur. It's like you do it because you wanna you know, be your own boss and own your own schedule and all of this. But when your company gets larger, to me it's like you end up just being an employee at your company, right? Like I don't own my own schedule or do any of that stuff because I'm, I'm like a piece of this bigger machine. Um, but that's just part of growth, I think. So that's kind of an exciting part, but also not really what you thought when you were getting into being, you know, independent. Thank you so much. Uh, and then we'll hear from Ashlyn. What do you think the trends have seen, you've been seeing for entrepreneurs these days um, and how hard it's been for them? Like, what do you think is changing about it? Anything you'd add? One trend is that almost everybody's turning to VC and there are a lot of unknown unknowns when you are getting money for your business and you have to turn to other people who are experts to help you answer questions so you're not walking in that room alone. Challenge for women is that 2% of all VC money, we're talking like hundreds of billions of dollars, 2% goes to women founders, 11.5% uh, goes to women slash men co-founders where there's at least one woman that's a co-founder as part of a team. So that means 86% of that money is going to men. 
uh, further, I think, I think it's like 7% of employees at VCs are women. Um, and that's even lower for partners. Um, so when you're turning to these people to ask questions, they're mostly men and they're people who may not have gone through the same kinds of challenges that you've gone through, or as a woman, you're launching a business that's different than like the experience that most men have gone through. But I think the biggest challenge for a female entrepreneur is that the men who are at these VCs are judging whether they're going to give these women money based on their repertoire of seeing companies come in and out and in and out. And there's a profile that a successful founder looks like, and VCs typically use a heuristic to say, do I think that this person, regardless of their gender, is going to succeed? And the fewer women that come in front of them, the less opportunity that they have to say, okay, this heuristic matches this person. As a result, women get less money, there are less women in VC, and it becomes a lot harder to succeed when you are going with investment like mechanisms like bootstrapping versus getting VC when the rest of the world is getting VC money. I have one thing to say about that. I've talked to a lot of people who are in, in that arena, venture capitalists, and they will tell you that a lot of times when women come in to pitch their businesses, they're timid, they're not as bold, they don't assume what they're going to accomplish, and men may not even know they're going to be able to do it, but they'll come in and say, we're gonna grow by 15% here, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and so they come in with the confidence and the bravado, and the women are probably a little more realistic, you know, but they're a little too shy about it, a little too, humble and so a lot of times they get pushed aside because there just doesn't seem to be the vision there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it's a factor on the other side too that I've, I've did some research on that too. All right well I'm gonna ask you go next. We, so I, my dissertation was about storytelling and entrepreneurship and whether or not if you tell a good story in your pitch like we're talking about in VCs do you get more money? Are your campaigns do they get more viral? Now I studied this specifically in crowdfunding campaigns so I love stories and we learn from stories. Uh, I teach a lot using the storytelling method. So, and we just love juicy stories and panels. So I'm gonna start with you um, and talk about a big mistake in running your business. What happened and what'd you learn from it and how can we help uh, the people sitting here learn from your mistakes? Okay. Uh, you know, you all talked about, you feel like these HR issues and all these things just come up all the time. The biggest mistake and I did it several times that I ever made in growing my company and trying to find the right people to do all these different things uh, was hire the wrong people sometimes. And this did not come because we didn't do our due diligence. You know, you interview someone, you take them to dinner, you get their references, you talk to them. But every time this happened where I would let someone in the door and sometimes very senior people who were not a fit, I should have listened to my gut every time because somehow I knew something wasn't right, even though everything added up. Their experience level, even references, you know, all kinds of things seemed to be the right person to lead that charge to do that. Once that individual got into the building and started working on the teams, you could just see how things would crumble apart. And other people would be demoralized, they hated them, they didn't want to come to work, and they despised these people. And so I always, finally, I came up with this phrase that says, we just have to shoot the assholes. <laughs> and we would, and I, I had to do it. And guess who would have to do it? You grew up on the ranch. So yeah, I did, yes, I did. Sure did. Uh, and so I was always the one responsible for having to go and take the keys away from them, walk them out the door, because I would made the mistake to hire them. And so it was it's really something that you think, oh gosh, we can just put up with that individual, they've got the talent, they've got the skills, we'll, we'll give them a chance, we're gonna do this. Sometimes you have to just take them out because the minute you do, it's like ding dong, the witch is dead <laughs> and everyone in the organization is very much excited and, and believes in you because you're gonna stand up to it. And the other piece of this is having clients, and we, you know, we had clients as an advertising agency and they were occasionally, not very often, but clients who would let in, who were abusive to the staff, they you know really did not give good direction, they, they, their budgets were off, a lot of different things, and I had to fire some clients too. Right. Again, you 
gain though back, if you can make the corrections, you know, and get it right, you will gain back the confidence and trust of your team. If you let these things just fester and move on, the whole morale, the whole thing of the company starts to go down. And this is one thing we study a lot in the management department, toxic bosses and toxic employees, and how damaging that is for the whole organization, especially young employees who are working for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, or they're blaming them for things when they're not getting that clear direction. That's what I was gonna add. I've had the same experience and I have several friends, whether you use culture index or whatever, that if you if you test for certain things, because yeah, the resume could look like a dream and all of that, but the fit that you need, like actually you need an executor or a visionary or whatever, some of those things, it's literally, is really hard to interview for, but it can be tested for, that works. Well, watch the references too, and I don't mean to take over this panel, but, but um, a lot of times a reference cannot really tell you the 100% truth about the individual, because they're only gonna tell you so much. And so calling references, talking to them is a good thing, but you have to take some of that with a grain of salt. And I didn't listen close enough. Some of the references went underneath. They were really trying to tell me something, and I didn't pay attention to those cues. Tiffany, um, Let's hear from you on a big mistake in your, how yeah. the cookie crumbled. Oh my <laughs> gosh, you made so <laughs> many mistakes. <laughs> um, one that comes to mind for me is early scaling. And one of the biggest, so we had uh, one location here in Austin and we had been doing that for a handful of years, but we were like really tiny. Um, and then we decided we wanted to create a second location. And instead of doing another one here in Austin, we decided to do it in downtown Dallas. So it was like three hours away because we thought our business was largely for people that were in downtown settings. Um, and so we thought, well, we've already done Austin, so we'll do Dallas. And that was fine, um, but when we got there, we were teeny tiny, and we had no marketing budget, and we were super, super slow. But the, So that was kind of a mistake right there. But the bigger mistake was that we thought we were empowering our team by letting them run it the way they wanted to run it. So we sent some managers that had been working in Austin, we said, you go manage that store in Dallas. And over time, we'd, we'd go there and we'd see something would be a little different. And we're like, oh, well, let's not step on their toes because, you know, we want them to feel empowered that, you know, we want them to feel ownership over this store, even though it was our store. Um, and then what we noticed was they were making changes. So they had um, they, their dough puck machine was making their dough balls larger than ours. And when they were doing that, where they were then putting them into the oven and cranking up the temperature because it was needed to be hotter just to cook them. So eventually we actually physically got like slightly different cookies because we didn't want to step on their toes. And um, it came to a point where we realized that we were not empowering them by doing this. We weren't helping them. We were just letting them be on an island and create their own processes, their own systems, and in the end result, a totally different product than what we were selling here in Austin. And the solve for it ended up being face-to-face -face meetings that we would do once a month with them, on top of all the communication we would regularly do. We would come in face-to-face, -face, either in Austin or in Dallas, and talk through what's working, what's not working, and then we would come together and say, we're all going to do it this way. Or if we had a new idea of how we would operate, we're all going to do that together. Um, so that was one of our big learnings, was letting people out on an island doing their own thing doesn't work. You need communication if you're going to be running something that's separate. If we had to do it again, we would probably have opened our second and third locations here in Austin where we could have learned how to scale physically in the place where we were. Um, but at the same point, it was great jumping off because we are a multi-unit um, business and there's a ton of challenges with that. So it was great to just like jump right off into the deep end and understand and learn how to do that um, and how to create culture. That's the biggest problem or the, that's it's so important but it's really challenging to create culture when you're not in the same place so we have like 76 locations with 1800 people and we're all trying to strive for the same vision but they need to understand what that vision is we need to all be aligned and that's really tricky when we're not all in one building we can't have a fun happy hour we can't all go to dinner they don't they don't know who i am i mean they know who i am but like we haven't met um and so that was some of those challenges that we learned early how to uh, do separate. So on the one hand, it was a huge mistake. On the other hand, it was kind of nice that we got it over with at the very, very beginning. Okay, we're gonna talk about funding. It's a super hot topic on campus. 
We have countless workshops that are happening all across campus. We have over 100 centers, initiatives, undergraduate clubs, all this stuff is happening and this is a very hot topic. Ash did a great job of telling us about the funding that's happening here. And so as you look at this panel, we've got Tiffany who's taken VC and then Connie and Gay who just bootstrapped. So we're gonna have a couple of different perspectives here on that and let's have, um, Let's see, Gay, yeah, you want to start? Just bootstrapping, what that was like? Yeah, it, it, you know, I look back on it now after being in that business for over 30 years and I can't believe we did it. But, real history, my father died when I was 13. And so I started working, I had my first job when I was 13 and I learned how to manage a budget and I helped put myself through college and all those things. And so working and managing a budget and keeping up with not overspending what I had was just part of who I am. And so when I started the company, I, I thought about it. You know, everybody said, oh, you gotta get a line of credit. You gotta kind of get some money. And I said, no, we're gonna do it this way. Well, I did get a line of credit. We never used it. And we were able to grow to a major, like a $350 million company with no, no VC money, no bank loans, nothing. Because when I, the more I would find out about it, the more I know that then they were gonna control the company. And so I wanted to have complete control, except we only work for our clients. And uh, so we figured it out. So because of it, I had through the years incredible contracts, incredible ability to collect money, incredible ability to manage the workflows and also to manage what we were gonna charge for things. And so we really, really had to be smart and work hard at it, but we never borrowed any money. I never had anyone looking over my shoulder saying, no, you can't open that office in San Francisco. Or you can't do this, or you can't do that. Uh, and so again, it was just working for the clients. Again, I look back and sometimes I can't believe we did it because there were some horrible things that happened to us. I mean, we lost an $80 million account one day and almost killed me. And uh, things like that, somehow we were able to pull it off. Uh, but it took daily management. I washed my cash flow every day. I met with the CFO every day. I knew exactly how much people owed us every minute and I just monitored the money all the time. Even though I was a new business person, boy, I kept my eye on the cash. And I had this one phrase that says, you better know your money, and I mean know it inside and out. Whether you're borrowing money or not, it's the key thing to stay in a healthy business. Connie, anything you'd add to that about the bootstrapping experience? Yeah, I. Um, it's funny, I was, I was laugh when I think about this because when I started the company, you know, in the early 2000s, I, I didn't have an MBA, I didn't have a big business plan, and I just, I knew these, I wanted to do these things. And so, um, I barely even got my business cards back, and people started asking me, what's your exit strategy? What's your five-year growth plan and your exit strategy? I was like, I just went from corporate America to being employee number one. I don't know what my exit strategy is, you know? And it was so funny, so I was like, okay, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. So I made a plan, and I had a five-year exit strategy, and. You know, a lot of companies in the fashion industry at that time, of course, they were growing five to seven years and then they were selling to one of the big fashion houses and that was common. So I was like, that's what's gonna happen to me. And um, so then I was like, okay, that's aggressive growth. I need to go get money. So I started going and asking for money. And then I found the old adage to be true that when you need money, nobody really wants to give you any. So I really couldn't. I had a hard time getting money and so I just, focused on, you know, I want to do my art, I want to work in Mexico, I want to help women, and I just kind of put one foot in front of the other and started growing the business, and it worked, and we started scaling, and I mean, you know, in the last five years, we've grown 10 times, and we didn't take any money, but it was cash is king, like especially in an inventory intensive business. Every investment we make, whether it's in a person or anything, has to have a very quick return because we cannot have money floating out there that's not making money. And so it's been really challenging, but we're really in a place right now where we're having to decide, are we gonna take funding and continue this aggressive growth because the inventory and all of that is just so big that we're gonna be at a point where we just can't self-fund or are we going to get disciplined and have paced growth and, and slow down intentionally because we want to self fund? So that's that's really where we are right now. And then we'll have Tiff talk a little bit about just the experience of VC. Yeah, so we started um, by just cash in a solo cup. Um, that was the first cash we were reinvesting into our company. And then we ended up getting um, our first line of credit was maybe two years in 
and we did use it immediately. Um, the thing about our business is we need capital to expand. Um, every store, you know, costs multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to build. And we can't, because we are delivering on demand, we need those units and we need those delivery units. Um, so I think it's like, we don't have possibly as many choices. Um, we started by taking out loans, but like you said, at a certain point, um, they stopped loaning. Um, and so that was in 2008, but, and we met our first investor then. So we had an angel investor that came along just at the right time because we could not get a loan to save our lives. And that was to build our North Austin location. In fact, we had already signed the lease and the construction contract. And then we were like, okay, now let's figure out how to pay for it. And then the banks were like, no, no you're not. Uh, but we got very, very lucky with our uh, a connection we had. And we had already been in business for a long time at this point. We had been growing extremely slowly, um, but we had been in business almost 10 years. We already had proprietary software that we had built. Um, we had sort of a brand to sell. Um, so we sat down and we met with this angel and he is, we really, really lucked out because I think if we had the wrong person in that position, it could have totally tanked us. Yeah. We had the right person in that position. So he um, he invested, I think, $1.2 million at that time just personally, which first of all, we learned later because now we've raised almost $100 million. And that's this meeting was like nothing like any of the other meetings that we would have later. Um, but he just believed in us. He thought we could do it. We had um, a brand behind us. We had technology we had built behind us and we had a vision for growth. And he, and he believed in us and he wanted to let us do it. He didn't, he wasn't looking to come in and help us run it or tell us how to do it or put his opinions on, on it. He was just there for support. And if we needed help, he would help. Um, but if not, he was going to stay out of our, out of our way. And that was exactly what we needed in order to be able to build to that next stage of growth. Um, so we kept taking some friends and family type of funding for a while. We ended up getting um, some private equity money later and then bigger, more institutional funding from there. Um, and you know, there are pros and cons to doing it. One of the things is, one of the reasons we fundraise so much is we don't wanna be in a position where we're making cash decisions because we wanna be making decisions for the brand and for our growth, not because we're out of cash. Um, so we kind of always have that in mind um, and we take opportunities when we can. It does mean, you know, from our very first investor, obviously we formed a board, uh, which we were nervous about. We, had, we didn't want to do that because we thought somebody was going to tell us what to do. Uh, he didn't. And so that was great. We had a great first board. Um, and still, we don't have anybody that's got majority ownership. So nobody's telling us what we can or can't do per se. But certainly bigger decisions like where we're going to expand, you need a board vote for that. Um, so I think it really depends on how who's on your board, how you craft that. We've got a lot of people on our board that are representing their investments. We've got a couple of independents. Um, but it's a lot of noise in the room. You know, everybody's got their own opinion. These are all smart, successful people. It can be a little bit challenging to listen to all the opinions and figure out where you really want to go. But for the most part, it's still been a positive experience for us. And we still feel very much in control of where we're going um, and the decisions we make. We just have to answer in a certain way to someone else. But I kind of think everyone has to answer to someone else in one way or another. So you're, you're answering to something. I think it just depends what you choose to answer to. And that's actually what you've been through is a pretty common challenge. I've seen a lot of women founders who have like 10 million ARR and they're up against a guy who drew an idea on a napkin and he gets 20 million with like a 200 post and the woman walks away with a really shitty deal. Um, it's just unfortunately like, it's not funny anymore. You know, like it's, it's a very common experience. I have a great little story for you. Uh, two of my good friends are Maggie Wildwater and Denise Morrison. Both became CEOs, Denise of, um, of Campbell Soup and Maggie of Frontier Communications. And they tell the story of when they were young girls, their dad made them write a business plan every year for what they were going to accomplish. Their budget, what they were going to uh, try to achieve, what programs they wanted to be involved in, what camp they wanted to go to, and they would sit down at the kitchen table and make them go through this exercise. And they both now will tell you, he was training us to be CEOs or leaders, at least business leaders. And so both of them were trained that way. And he also took them into his office and let them meet people and sit there with them. And you know, even before that bring your daughter work day kind of thing was popular, you know, he, he really did instill in them values and the skill sets 
to be able to run their money and run a business and think strategically and write plans. And so I think that's probably one of the coolest things I ever heard. I mean, no one ever did that for me. I kind of got thrown into stuff like that because my father died and my mother was a mess with money. So I ended up managing money. But that's a really good thing that I think, you know, if it's fathers with these daughters, you know, and even with sons, of course, you know, you want them to start thinking a little bit more about, you know, how, how life works and how business works. I'd like to add, I, sorry, I'd like to add an easy one. Have them get a job, a J-O-B, as, yeah. as a white person in a restaurant. Like, when you turn 15, go work at Sonic. Like, it's, I think there's these simple things of like interacting with humans and having earned money and what it means to get a tip and clean up the stuff in the back kitchen. I just think a lot of that could go a long way today. And I mean, you want to teach your daughters the value of compounding money, right? You want them to uh, get a savings account now versus in 20 years. Think about the investments that they're gonna make in their professional careers the same way. You want to introduce them to interesting people, tell them what about like all of these different industries are, help them understand what the difference is between going into PR versus oil and gas, help them understand what the role of going to college is going to play. Um, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, there are more men named John than women in that group. Um, and while groups like YPO and Chief are important, it's about those steps that get you there. And if you can compound your, your professional success from an early age, you'll get there at 30 versus 65. So start early, not you know after they've gone to college and they're trying to figure out what their major is. Personally, I could add team sports is where I learned leadership skills and confidence skills. And then I went on to tear three ACLs and didn't <laughs> compete in, in COVID sports. Um, but so I spent my whole life summers like playing sports and going to sports camp. I did do a little bit of art camp, which I loved. And if I weren't a college professor, I, I, I would love to be like an elementary art school teacher. But all that aside, there are camps now for entrepreneurship. There's one in Austin called Moolah U and it teaches them about entrepreneurship like at the age of six and these six-year-olds will come to you on Tuesday and they'll ask you for a $50 loan if you want to mentor them um, as a barracuda so there there are camps and organizations and programs that they can enroll in and it's amazing like when I was growing up I was playing sports and I didn't know that there was things like speech and debate and forensics and where they can learn public speaking skills or they can compete in case competitions and at a very, very young age, they're doing that in high school. And it's incredible. Those students who come in with that experience are so much further ahead than students who come in freshman year, and they're, especially at a big school like this, and they're so lost, and they haven't, they don't know how to find their tribe, and they don't know how to do, like even working for the paper or the yearbook, or doing those things is so important instead of, you know, this all day. My wife is Chinese, so, not first hand, but second hand experience. She and I also met while we were working at Palantir. So we were in the same room. Um, and she went to Princeton, got a degree in economics, went to work at Goldman. And when we were in the room with Fortune 500 white male CEOs, they would look to me and ask questions after she just got done doing a presentation. I'm a very big fan of being aware of what you're doing and what you're saying in a, in a meeting, in a room. So find out who did the, the PowerPoint and direct your questions to them. Uh, don't assume that the woman in the room is there to get the coffee or direct the PowerPoint um, or take notes. Um, make sure that you are splitting eye contact among everyone. Um, don't, uh, I have to say this, it should go without saying, but don't mansplain. Um, assume that every female in the room with you is uh, of the same caliber of intelligence that you are. Um, and for women of color, for anyone of color, um, for anyone who is underprivileged or uh, experiences any sort of minority status, um, keep in mind all of the barriers that they had to overcome simply to be in that room and do whatever you can to help them get to the next level.
there are a lot of successful women and men of color out there. And I think sometimes it's just identifying who they are and where they are and, you know, networking with them and getting some of our children exposed to them and, and highlighting their successes. Um, one of the things that we've been really mindful of in this, again, this Women Who Need Business program is getting a diverse group of women there and they're learning from each other and it's been very exciting to see that. Um, but you have to reach out and send to some of these big companies and, that are sponsoring women to come and say, we want some diverse candidates here. And you have to push for it, you know, and ask for it. But then more and more bubble up and you see more success and you share that. Diversity and inclusion, d and as it's called on university campuses is a big focus. It's like all, all the rage as it should be. So one thing that I am consciously doing is looking at my semester's worth of curriculum and the Harvard Business Review offers cases and most of those cases, the protagonist in the case is white male. So making sure that the cases are completely changed and that we have the founder of Stitch Fix, who, female, right? So can they start to see these players that look like them, that sounds like them? We listen to How I Built This podcast and making sure that they're listening to the stories of people who look like them, who sound like them. That's really important. When I have sharks come into the classroom, making sure I have a wide variety of diversity and inclusion of people that look like them and people that sound like them. So, so that's one thing that I can speak to, at least in the classroom, is if I'm kind of the curriculum piece, hopefully sending them on out into the world to you all to mentor further and groom. I would just add, you know, for me in the fashion world, it's like um, we produce everything in Mexico and uh, like 60% of our corporate team are Latin American. And so, you know, until recently, I thought that was great. And then it's like the awareness of like, no, that's not good enough. There, you know, are other areas where you need to be working harder to be inclusive. And so we've made concentrated efforts in those areas now because it really, really does matter. So. And I'm a big person on diversity of thought because I think it's diversity of color, of background, of industry, all those things, but you have to have people who think differently too. Uh, because if everyone's just saying think to style, then you're not gonna be very innovative or creative. So we were really, really always watching even Myers-Briggs and you know different kinds of uh, pro to, uh, personality profiling to make sure that we were bringing in people who, who brought a different perspective in a way that would come at a problem. And it really created a more innovative environment on all those fronts. Yeah, I really wanna jump back into that early childhood development. Uh, again, I told you I was an only child. And sometimes when you're an only child, your parents will drag you along to things or let you go to an event or go to things just because they have to get a babysitter. And so from the time I was a really little child, I was talking to adults a lot and talking about what was going on and, and you know exposed to things and just and my mother was a real big believer in what she always says expose your children to all kinds of different people and things and you know cultural events and all that stuff it opens your mind up and you're not just pigeonholed as well the kid that stays home with the babysitter who talks you know to other kids all the time you need to be exposed to you know interesting people i think and that's a great thing that a parent can do such an important point. In fact, I've, I've been trying to get my students to do that more and thinking about assignments because students don't do optional. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and so my idea was to have them go into a retirement community. Um, my, da my grandfather lives in a retirement community. I've been going to them for years and I actually think they're amazing places. Um, and you get to talk to really interesting people about their stories. And we haven't been able, I haven't been able to assign that assignment recently due to COVID, but having them talk to different people, because again, they're intimidated no matter the age and, and, and gender, I think, especially this new generation.